Hello there. It's really hard to make games that are actually fun because it's difficult to define exactly what fun even is. Both Chess and Rocket League are games that I personally find really fun, but the type of fun is completely different. So there's a problem with using the word fun for games that we really enjoy playing because it's a very vague word. And that is where MDA comes in. A framework devised by these clever people that you will find really useful if you make games or even if you just play them. It helps us understand the reasons why people play games beyond just generically calling them fun. Each part of the framework is really exciting to me and it's a really interesting way of looking at the games we play and design. So subscribe if you want to keep on learning new game dev stuff and let's press on. MDA is an acronym and the M stands for mechanics. They are the rules, data structures and algorithms you find in every game, the individual components and features. Some examples of this include pressing the A button in Mario makes him jump, the algorithm that randomly generates levels in Spelunky, throwing a grenade in Halo. Mechanics make up the smallest components of a game and they serve as the building blocks for subsequent layers. It's also important to remember that mechanics by themselves are really boring. Throwing a grenade in Halo is only interesting when combined with other mechanics like the physics system of it flying through the air, the health and damage system for it to deal damage to enemies, and the behaviour for enemy AI. It is when you combine each of these things together, these building blocks, that you end up with dynamics. Now, when I say that a game has a big D, I'm of course saying that it's got great dynamics. Dynamics are very closely related to gameplay. It describes the behaviour of the game when each of the mechanics are interacting with each other and the player. A player character with a set of mechanics like jumping, running, diving is great, but it's really boring if it's just left alone in an empty void. Likewise, a level in a game can be full of platforms, obstacles and enemies, all really interesting things, but they're actually really boring if there's no player to interact with any of them. Dynamics are the really awesome things that happen in games when a set of mechanics are put together. In fact, a lot of the time when people say that they really enjoy a game's mechanics, they're probably actually referring to the dynamics of the game, at least in terms of the MDA framework. Jumping around in any of the Mario games wouldn't be that interesting or even possible if there weren't any platforms to jump off of but something even better starts to happen when lots of dynamics work together while playing a game. Aesthetics. Despite our first instincts, aesthetics, at least in terms of MDA, aren't just the visuals of a game. Aesthetics instead refers to the more abstract emotions and feelings that players get when they play a game. They are the reasons we are compelled to keep on playing. The MDA paper mentions eight aesthetics that I'll talk about now, but these are by no means the only aesthetics that exist. It's also important to note that most games will generally evoke multiple aesthetics and to varying degrees. So let's begin. Sensation. Enjoying the audio and visual effects. A great example of this is a juiced up action game like Doom. Every action and reaction, every cause and effect in Doom is really exciting and satisfying to do. But excessive repeated exposure reduces the effect. People get bored of seeing and feeling the same sensations over and over again, so a game will generally need to combine one or two other aesthetics with sensation if they want their players to keep on coming back. Fantasy. Escaping to an imaginary world. A huge amount of games use fantasy, but to a varying degree. So I think there's a difference between a game having an imaginary setting or theme, and a game really trying to immerse you in its world with fleshed out characters, world building, and lore. Enter the Gungeon is set in an imaginary gun-filled world, but it mostly serves the gameplay as a fun and convenient setting. On the other hand, Skyrim is a huge open world game with rich lore and history that really encourages the player to get lost in the fantasy of being the Dragonborn. Narrative, having a heavy focus on a compelling plot. This keeps players coming back so they can see the full story. This aesthetic doesn't always lend itself to replayability, but some games try to overcome this with branching pathways and multiple endings. However, replayability isn't everything and some of the most impactful games I've played have focused on delivering a clear and succinct story. I don't need to play them again. Challenge. The urge to master something and doing it perfectly. Speedrunning is a clear example of this aesthetic, which I think is really interesting because some of the most popular speedrunning games weren't even designed for speedrunning. Roguelites like Spelunky also fit into this category of challenge because they force you to master the dynamics of the game rather than memorise level layouts by randomising the levels. Since challenge entices mastery and perfection through practice and repetition, it often leads to higher replayability in a game. Fellowship. 
playing games with other people and or having a sense of community. Co-op and team-based games, such as Among Us, rely on experiencing the game with other people in order for them to be engaging. Because I don't know if you've tried single player Among Us, but it's pretty boring. Single player games can have this too, although it's much less likely, because they need a really active sharing sense of community outside of the game. But I suppose that can be achieved in games like Mario Maker, where you share levels with lots of other people. Discovery. Having the urge to explore the game world. Breath of the Wild is a great example of this. Open world games with hundreds of locations make you want to find that next secret or investigate that new zone you haven't been to before. Although generating enough content to keep players discovering stuff all the time can be really difficult to do. Any game that you play for the first time has an element of discovery, but discovery games tend to keep that feeling going for the duration of the playthrough. Expression. Using your own creativity in a game. Creating your own character that you identify with in a game and picking your favourite armour for it is a form of expression. By putting a piece of ourself into the game, we become more attached to it. So is solving a puzzle or challenge in a game your way that feels like you came up with a creative solution. Scribblenauts does this really well by allowing players to beat the levels in whatever crazy way they want to. Submission. Games that provide a sense of ease, comfort, and just let you zone out as a pastime. Because sometimes at the end of a hard day's work, you just want to relax and disengage. There are games that focus in on this feeling to an almost alarming degree, like hyper casual mobile games with addictive gameplay mechanics. But it could just be a game that you've played so many times that you just feel really at home in it. Or submission could come from doing a relaxing and monotonous task like mining in Minecraft. The effective combination of these aesthetics is what I think we're often referring to when we say a game is fun. I say Breath of the Wild is fun, but that's because I keep getting drawn in by the heavy elements of fantasy and discovery, while also throwing in elements of challenge and sensation and a light narrative. The MDA framework is great for helping us understand games better, but why is it so important for both players and designers? Well, it's because players and designers naturally end up looking along the MDA framework in the opposite direction. Players see and feel the aesthetics first, and usually won't think too hard about the mechanics or dynamics, and I mean, they usually have no real reason to either. But when you want to start to think about the design of a game, and especially when you want to make a game yourself, you can actually only create the building blocks that are mechanics. You can't just implement an aesthetic into a game. Like I said, aesthetics are built out of the dynamics, which in turn are built out of the mechanics, the algorithms and data. This can easily result in us losing out on the aesthetic we originally wanted to convey to the player, because we're so zoomed in on doing mechanic after mechanic that we forget to take a step back and look at the aesthetic of the bigger picture. We need to take a step back and check that the mechanics and the resulting dynamics are actually building towards the aesthetic we want to give to our player. After all, aesthetics is what the player wants, and if it's done well, it will be the fun that the player gets to experience. You can take these ideas and start applying them immediately to any games. Perhaps in the comments, let me know how your game is aiming for a particular aesthetic. And if you're not working on a game, let me know how your favourite game achieves a particular aesthetic. I'll leave an example for my current game project, Project Drifter, in the comments as well. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe for more game dev content. Follow me on Twitter for updates on my current game, Project Drifter. Join the Discord to interact with other devs, and until next time, goodbye.